Our Holy Gospel comes to us from the 26th chapter of St. Mark and the 22nd chapter of St. Luke. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, Jesus began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not what as I will, but as you will. And there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling to the ground. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Heavenly Father, we come before you today. We ask that you would speak to us in your word. May you continue to cut through all of the noise of our life, and may you continue to announce to us the very forgiveness that is ours in Christ. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. So we are excited to have this opportunity to continue in the series that we've been doing, this being challenge, as we've been thinking and reflecting upon what it means to go and to grow deeper within our relationship and our connection within those very spiritual disciplines of growing in that grace, that forgiveness, and that good news of Jesus Christ. Is that each and every day we have that opportunity to go and to grow deeper into His very promises for us that we might be refreshed and renewed as those blood-bought, forgiven children of God. So far, we've had the chance to look at what it means to commit to community, of having those around us that would not only befriend us, but those who would have those very words of gospel grace upon their lips. The last week, we had the chance to look at what it meant to find our identity as we study Scripture. That it's not simply reading the Bible to get to know more of facts about God, but to go and to grow deeper into God's Word as we also come to know who we are. And so today, today we have the chance and the opportunity to look at what it means that Jesus within His message and His ministry towards us is that He prioritized prayer in everything that he desired to give us. I mean, relationships take communication. Great relationships require great communication. The fact is, for all of the very benefits that modern technology and everything else that has come as a part of that movement has come to benefit us in many ways, that hasn't it also changed the way that we communicate? or at least the way that we live. I mean, I remember the good old days when sometimes I would be assigned to be the one to go to the grocery store to go ahead and purchase our grocery items, pretexting and everything else, and what I got off the list was what I got off the list, is that I didn't need to worry about it. You had to be happy with what it is. But now when I come home with the wrong brand or the wrong thing or all kinds of other things of that, I say, what do I get? Why didn't you just text me? But we all know that how those texts go. Is that what brand of this do we get? Wait, wait, wait. The brown one, I think. That's not a brand. (laughs) Is it the light brown or the dark brown? Light brown. And then thinking, thinking, thinking. I think, (laughs) is that we all know all of those things, that sometimes it seems that we're just throwing off all of this communication, all of this stuff, all the time. I mean, nowadays, even just the way that we have to select how to communicate. As a pastor, when I try to think about communicating with you, I have to go through this process is it, should I call them or should I text them? Should I email them? What, what's going to be the best way for them to actually respond to me? And then there's the dreaded, I just got your voicemail when I finally decided I'll call them. That's more pastoral. And then I get that question, should I leave a voicemail? Is that going to make me seem, you know, old to those that are younger? 
Is that, should I hang it up? Should I text them back? Is that, what all is there? See, we have so many options. And we have so many ways that communication breaks down. That wouldn't it be such a benefit, such a blessing to cut through all of the confusion, all of the options, to cut through all of those things in this world, to simply have clear communication. But isn't that what our God gives us in prayer? That he invites us to block out all the noise, to stop all of the things, all of those stuff that is there, and to come and to bring our deepest needs, our deepest cares, our deepest praise to him. To cut out all of those things. The nearly 50 times in the Gospels, is that Jesus either taught on or continued to show the very importance of prayer in his life. That he prayed all over the place. That Jesus prayed so much and so differently that on multiple occasions the disciples who saw him, that they came and they asked him, Lord, teach us to pray. That's where we get that Lord's prayer. But I mean, when you begin to look at it, how many times had those disciples probably prayed in their life before? How many times had they went ahead and gone through the very motions of what they had learned, and yet when they saw Jesus and what he had to offer, there was something so different, something so eye-catching that they said that I want more of that. (laughs) I mean, even Martin Luther once commented on his own prayer life. He said, he said that sometimes I feel as if I'm becoming cold and apathetic towards prayer. That this is usually because of all of the things that are distracting me and filling my mind. So we all know that we have struggles. <laughs> We all know that maybe we've been praying many times before. Maybe we have every reason to maybe feel that guilt of we should be praying more. But the good news is this. That Jesus comes to us in his word and he desires to go ahead and have a power outage there. (laughs) It's all right, don't worry. Is that, that he desired that we might grow. That even though we struggle, even though we have our problems, that we might grow deeper in this. That Jesus prayed early and Jesus prayed often. (laughs) And isn't that what we begin to see in all of those things that he has to offer us? That it says in Mark chapter 1, very early in the morning while it was still dark, Jesus got up left the house and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Jesus was constantly kind of sneaking off here and there, getting away from it all. See, as we went through this series, it's kind of this interesting fact that I came to know, is that in his best-selling book, Greg McCown, in his best-selling book, Essentialism, explains the surprising history of a word that we're all too familiar with, the word priority. (laughs) Is that priority came into our English language in the 1400s, that's some time ago. And all the way through the 1900s, that word priority was always in the singular. For 500 years, that this word remained unchanged. Priority meant The first thing, not the first things, not the first many things, the first thing. But then in the 1900s, what did we figure? Is that we can have more than one priority, right? We can do more, we can do better, we can do this and we can do that. And all of a sudden, companies started talking about all of their priorities And we started talking about all of our priorities of responsibility. But when when we find ourselves simply focusing on everything, are we focusing on anything? That Jesus comes to us today to talk to us about that priority of prayer. 
of putting the first thing as the first thing in our life? Is prayer our last resort? Kind of after we've grumbled to everybody else about our problem, that then, well, maybe God could hear about it for a little bit too. Or is prayer our very first response? See, as we turn to God's Word and as we turn to the ministry of Jesus, there are three things. Three things that we want to call our attention to as we desire to grow in that gospel, experience that grace, and to come to know the forgiveness that is ours because of Christ. The first thing, the first thing is that very fact that Jesus prayed Himself because He needed help. I want you to think about that. Jesus needed help. Is that why did he pray so often to the Father? Is that he who we, claim, who we continue to confess is divine and yet also human, even he in his human life and in his ministry knew what it was to need the Father, to need God's work within his life, his very care and direction. Just look at our gospel reading today. That as Jesus is overwhelmed, flooded with all of the fear, with all of the sorrow, with all of the anxiety and worry of what it meant for a perfect person to now be punished for the sins of the whole world. That Jesus began to become so worried, so anxious, so stressed, that he began to sweat blood. That's a medical condition Self. And so what does Jesus do? That over and over again, Jesus comes to the Father and prays. So what does he pray? That not my will, but your will be done. That what happens when we pray? What happens when we go to God? That we make a confession. We make that confession that we need God. Why? We make need God in our life for the very fact that He is God and that I am not Him. That we confess in prayer that we are not the one in control. We are not the one on the throne. We are not the one calling the shots. But how many times in all of the other areas of our life do we pretend as if we just tried our hardest or put our attention or our work to focus that somehow we might get a hold of this? Or even in our prayers, how often do we try to control God by directing Him to this is what I want you to do? That we come to confess that He is the one in control. And that we are in need of Him every time that we pray. That secondly, is that Jesus prayed in this life because He needed direction. That we all know what it is to be in need of direction of all of those things, not just physically, but in all of those areas of life. But so many times when we need directions, so where do we turn? So we turn to those things that might guide us or direct us or those things that are there. We might turn to our GPS or constant other things. So I still remember watching a comedy special a number, number of years ago. Is that Tim Hawkins once described driving into Dallas with a GPS and he said, I think it literally said as I, wa- as I drove into Dallas, you're on your own. <laughs> as I laughed, I found it funny. Until the first time I drove into Dallas and my GPS said, turn right, I turned right. And it said, recalculating. I turned then left as it told me. And what did it say? Recalculating. I think eight recalculatings later, I was out of Dallas and glad that I didn't have to go back. (laughs) But when we begin to think about all of those directions, that not only does sometimes technology let us down, but how many other things in this very world, how many ways are we following to the directions of the world and not the very directions that our God has for us? 
is that we so desperately want and desire to know where God is leading. That James 1 verse 5 says this, If any of you lacks wisdom, that you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding faults. That he invites us to come to him, to turn to him, to listen and reflect and be centered in him. That in certainly we need God. Secondly, we need his direction. But thirdly, we also need that very rest that he has to offer. That we need that rest for our souls, that rest for our lives, that we find ourselves surrounded by noise, surrounded by options, surrounded by the chaos of things that are there. And even in our own minds, how often do we have a hard enough time even focusing upon prayer? But God invites us to come, to find our rest, to find our peace. That he has reminded us that in my cross that I have given you that relationship. I have called you by name. That I have indeed washed you of your sins. I have called you my child and I have promised that even when you don't have the words that I know what you're thinking. (laughs) That even when you find yourself worn out and wearied out is that I invite you to come away. Come and rest and refresh me. So there's a devotional booklet that I use. And on the front cover of that devotional booklet there's two verses and two questions. So one of those verses is this. That in Mark chapter 6 verse 31, Jesus said this to his disciples. Come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest. For many were indeed coming and going, but they did not even have leisure to eat. See, Jesus invites us. He invites us to come and to find rest, to come and come away from it all. The question that is under that verse on my devotional resource is this. Jesus invites, but do I answer? So the second verse that is there on that front of that devotional is this. From Acts chapter 4 verse 13, that when Peter and John find themselves now after Jesus has risen from the dead and as they now proclaim what has now happened, that they are now dragged before the very same people that sentenced Jesus to to death and they are now unwilling to back down, that they are unwilling to turn away. And this is what Acts 4.13 says. When the leaders saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were astonished. And then it says this. They recognized that they had been with Jesus. These ordinary, common, uneducated men were so bold, so wise, so ready. Why? Because they had been with Jesus. And that second question on my devotional is this. That question of this. That will I be known as a person who has spent time with Jesus? That he invites us to come and find the rest in his cross, to come and to find our needs met in him, to come and confess that he is Lord of all, to put prayer as the priority as we start our day, when we find ourselves in need and in all of those moments in between. And so I invite you to please bow your heads in prayer with me as I join with a word of prayer from Flannery O'Connor. That, dear God, I cannot love thee the way I want to. That you are the slim crescent of a moon that I see and myself is indeed the earth shadow that keeps me from seeing all the moon has to offer. That what I am afraid of, dear God, is that my self shadow will grow so large that it blocks the whole moon and that I will judge myself by the shadow that is nothing. For I don't, do not know you, God, because I am in the way. May God bless you this day. Amen.